Thanks, John. Um, guys, I don't know if this clicker's working. I don't have any slides. Uh, I just wanted to come up here, introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, uh, Chris Fernari. I'm the editor of Brewbound. Uh, and I guess sort of my job right now is to just tell you uh, what we have planned for today. Um, I'm sure you guys have already seen the schedule, either online or uh, you know the agenda sort of handed to you when you walked in. Uh, but we have a great morning lined up and um, you know, some really great speakers. Uh, our first speaker of the day is, is a guy who needs no introduction and I think as I look out uh, in our audience today, uh, he's the only one currently drinking a beer, so that's awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's Jim Cook, the founder and, and chairman of Boston Beer Company. Um, I asked Jim to come in today and, and talk a little bit about innovation. Uh, you know, he's a guy who started brewing, like many of you, on his kitchen stove 29 years ago. Um, and it turned into Boston Lager, which has turned into so many other fine offerings, uh, many of which we get to enjoy here. Uh, you know, not, not the least of which is uh, his Sam Adams uh, Utopius, uh, which is uh, an excellent uh, 30 percent or so uh, brandy-like offering. Um, and it's those types of beers that have really sort of defined his company over the years, really breaking style boundaries. Uh, so he's going to talk a little bit about uh, innovation, not only in beer styles, but also in packaging, um, and just some of the decisions he made along the way uh, throughout the course of 29 years that's really propelled his, uh, his company to where it is today, which is the largest uh, craft brewery in the country. So uh, Jim, come on up. <laughs> and I will, I will make one quick reminder. Um, you can uh, text or tweet or email in your questions. Uh, it should be written on the top of the agenda. But if you guys are on Twitter and you want to tweet questions, I'll get them on an iPad up here. Use the hashtag BBSession. Uh, and make sure there's a question mark in there, and I'll be able to ask all our uh, presenters today questions. So, uh, yeah, Jim. Thanks. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, and, it, geez, I hate drinking alone. Uh, I should have brought more beer. Uh, but I guess everybody has something brewed, so brewed is good, even if it's coffee. Um, but. I'll be uh, the morning's designated drinker. And <clears throat> I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, innovation and uh, sort of the role it's played at Boston Beer Company. And I want to uh, probably start by uh, trying to put uh, this uh, innovation that uh, Sam Adams has been involved with for almost 30 years now, and, and uh, which has really become a hallmark of the craft beer uh, industry in America, maybe in a, a larger historical context. Uh, I, as some of you know, come from uh, uh, six generations of, of brewmasters. Every oldest son in my family has been a brewmaster since the 1840s. So it. Uh, perhaps you know gives me a, a different perspective uh, on things than many other people. And uh, the perspective I want to give you on what's going on today in craft beer in the United States um, is uh, pretty simple. What's going on today is uh, completely unique. Um, I guess there are no degrees of unique. Uh, so it's my English major daughter reminded me when I said something was really unique and she said, Dad, there is no degrees of unique. It's either unique or not unique. It's like virgin. Um, and <laughs> to which I f promptly found a bottle of extra virgin olive oil. Uh, <laughs> and she told me, well, in, in Italy there's degrees of virginity, but nowhere else. <laughs> So um, I'll just call this uh, unique. Uh, and when you step back and you look at the 12,000 years of brewing history, um, this moment 
in this place has never happened before and will probably never happen again. Never before, nowhere before, in 12,000 years of brewing history has there been so much creativity, so much innovation, so many new styles of beer being created, new brewing techniques, new ingredients and processes. It has never happened before and will not happen again. So um, as we you know, think about innovation, I want us to appreciate uh, the privilege that we as brewers have to be making beer, craft beer, here in the United States today. Uh, I am completely certain that a uh, hundred years from now, there will be brewers uh, all over the world. Uh, there will be, you know, craft brewers, and they will look back at this time and place uh, with uh, envy and regret. They will wish that they had been able to be a craft brewer in the United States today. Uh, so that is the context that we are in. It is an amazing time and place. We, you know, we're in it, uh, and like the fish, we may not be aware of the water, but that is the water that is all around us. This incredible energy and creativity that is pushing boundaries in every direction. Um, now, uh, I'm gonna maybe walk backwards to uh, where that began, and it, I'll just tell it's kind of my story, but there were, are certainly you know, many other craft brewers doing something of the same thing. But uh, <clears throat> when I started uh, brewing Sam Adams, in the very early days of craft brewing, in, in 1984, when um, there were a handful of craft brewers in the US. I think the only ones left from that time that are still uh, running their companies are uh, just Ken Grossman and I. So we're the, the last of, of uh, those people uh, doing this. But the, the roots of craft brewing um, in the beginning were, was a very different paradigm. It was basically about recreating in the new world the classic old world styles of beer that had been lost to America, and in some cases virtually lost uh, in uh, the old world as well. So it was all about making, you know, uh, porters, stouts, pale ales. I think that used to be uh, on Sierra Nevada's package, porter, stout, ale. Um, and we would, if you wanted to make a new style of beer in the United States, the way you did it was just look for something that was made in uh, the old world that nobody was making here, whether it was a brown ale, a Belgian ale, an ESB, uh, a Scotch ale, uh, a Bach, a double Bach. It was very easy uh, to come out with a new beer style. And I mean, that's kind of what we did as well. You know, we started, though at the very beginning, I was quite interested in sort of pushing into new things. I started with Sam Adams Boston Lager with a family recipe. The second beer we made actually uh, was a, a beer called Boston Lightship, um, which uh, I was uh, sort of uh, interest, uh, have a patent on the process. It was basically to make a beer under 100 calories that would have the flavor profile of a Heineken or a Bex. That was the idea. It's like, because those were the big beers back then. There weren't craft beers. Everybody who wanted good beer drank an import. And I thought, you know, I, I can see a way to make a beer with that flavor profile uh, that will have under 100 calories. And it uh, and it's and, and was made uh, without art of, you know without enzymes uh, was made according to the German beer purity law. So actually developed uh, a patent on uh, the mashing and loudering process uh, that was able to generate that amount of flavor 
and still have under 100 calories. So I guess from Sam Adams' point of view, there was always this sort of restlessness to push beer in new directions, but most of what we did was creating, you know, American versions of old world styles, whether it was, uh, I think our next beer went the other direction, it was Sam Adams' uh, Double Bock, uh, which has to this day a half a pound of malt per bottle. Um, so it's like jamming a loaf of bread into a bottle of beer. Uh, but then we made, you know, basic other stuff of Porter from George Washington's recipe uh, and an Oktoberfest, et cetera. And uh, that, for me, got kind of uh, boring almost. I mean, it was just too easy. Uh, you just look for styles in the old world and bring them here. Uh, and you didn't really have to do much. You just figure out how they make it over there. Let me make it over here. And then uh, in the early 90s, um, I got uh, this sort of epiphany, um, which uh, it was actually reading about the invention of champagne. And I had always assumed that you know, champagne had existed uh, for thousands of years. Um, and you know what, you know, when you read about it, you realize it was discovered by a guy. It was one guy um, that created it. And you know, it didn't exist when God made dirt and rocks and trees. Uh, it was the creation of a human imagination. And I guess the epiphany uh, back in 91, 92 was that there were truly wonderful, great styles of beer out there that nobody had made yet. Um, and uh, the notion that uh, all the great, great, uh, wonderful beers, most of them had never been made and were yet to be created. And I think that's really uh, at the foundation of craft brewing today, the belief that some of the world's great beer styles have not been brewed yet, and we will find them, create them, brew them. Uh, so my, and at that time, nobody had made beer over uh, about 14% alcohol. The highest alcohol beers in the world, there was a, a one or two uh, German double box, and I guess uh, the strongest beer in the world was called Sammy Claus, uh, a Swiss beer uh, that was made for Christmas. And no one in the history of beer had ever fermented grain had made beer over 14% alcohol. And I thought about it, and you know, it was sort of this sound barrier that everybody thought you couldn't get over. And I started thinking about it and realized, yes, uh, we can get there. I don't know what's gonna happen when we do, but I can see a path to get uh, the alcohol higher than that. And that was the beginning of uh, a really seminal beer uh, that started a lot of things. It was uh, Samuel Adams' Triple Bock. And it wasn't much of a commercial success. Um, it was kind of like, I don't know, the Altair 2000, um, which probably nobody's ever heard of uh, the Altair 2000. Does anybody know what it was? Yeah? No, before Steve Jobs. Everybody knows Steve Jobs. Before Steve Jobs, uh, the first, uh, what became, you know, it was then a microcomputer, became personal computers. Uh, the first PC was the Altair 2000. Um, completely forgotten triple box, kind of uh, that way. Um, but it was <clears throat> the, the first beer that got over 14% alcohol. It got up uh, to about 17 and a half, 18 percent alcohol, um, and we had to create lots of new things to go along with that. It was packaged uh, at that alcohol. We made it in a very small uh, 250 milliliter bottle that uh, was black, um, which we had to work with glass guys to uh, make a, a, a black bottle. Um, at that level of alcohol, the carbonation has long since fled the premises. 
Um, so uh, it had no CO2 in it, but uh, we left some yeast in there to keep going, uh, to keep fermenting it. Uh, so we had to design a, we, we uh, made the beer in a uh, sherry cork finished bottle with a sleeve over it that could expand and contract. So as the gas got formed, the bottle, the uh, cork could push up and kind of burp uh, and then come back down. Um, and uh, we sold it for $100 a case. And we sold, oh, and the last thing, which has become one of the foundations of craft brewing in the U.S., once we got the alcohol that high, it was really hot and boozy um, and really not that pleasant to taste. And to me, the whole purpose of making beer is not just to make things that are innovative or interesting or cool. Um, I don't want to make beer, no matter how interesting, innovative, and cool it is, unless it's a pleasure to drink. Because ultimately, that's what we all are trying to do, is create pleasure for people through beverages with alcohol in them. So uh, I thought about how do I take that heat down? And it wasn't a problem that I had to solve on my own. A bunch of illiterate, uh, you know, uneducated backwoodsmen uh, had figured it out 200 years before in Bourbon County, Kentucky, when they charred their oak barrels. And uh, the epiphany, again, it came at a Home Depot when they had all these bourbon barrels cut in half selling for $10 a piece. Um, and I realized, oh, wait a minute, there's a huge glut of these things. They don't know what to do with them um, because a bourbon barrel can only be used once. So uh, I called Bluegrass Cooperage. Um, I said, yeah, how many truckloads do you want? Uh, and I said, send me two and let me try it. Uh, he said, two truckloads? No, 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 two barrels. Um, and that was where the bourbon, where the, the barrel aging uh, began. We actually had to go to the TTB and I didn't think they were gonna approve it. The idea of aging beer in used spirits barrels, which we probably think has always been around. Um, nobody had done that until we started doing it with Sam Adams Triplebach. That dates to uh, early 1992 when we were developing that beer, even though today it looks like something that is obvious uh, and uh, must have been around hundreds of years ago. That is an innovation that is only 20 years old. Um, and I guess uh, when I think about innovation, uh, one of the things that I've learned is that uh, companies don't innovate. Um, only people innovate. Companies are good at, at doing the same thing, extrapolating, um, but if you want true innovation, it only comes from innovators. Uh, and I, I know because we look for them in our company, they generally have a screw loose. Um, they tend to be somewhat unmanageable, um, even difficult. Uh, but that, that is where innovation comes, and uh, craft brewing has, uh, I mean, you gotta have a screw loose to be in craft brewing, at least, you know, for most of the last 30 years. It's a little scary now that we're getting like Ivy League graduates deciding, do I go to Goldman Sachs or uh, do I go into craft brewing? That, that scares, uh, that scares uh, you know, the you know what out of me uh, when that starts to happen because I uh, have always cherished uh, the camaraderie of other craft brewers um, because, you know, they're generally, while cranky uh, and sometimes difficult, um, you know, none of them uh, are bound with conventional ways of doing things, and as a result, this has been uh, an amazing community of interesting, uh, divergent, and yes, 
uh, I would tell, tell my daughter, unique uh, individuals. And that is a really special part of this moment in brewing history. And uh, we should appreciate it, cherish it, and encourage it. Um, now, I could talk some more about innovation, but uh, when I'm talking, I don't get to drink. Um, if it's all right, uh, I'd love to uh, open up for questions um, so that I can drink a little bit. 